Facebook is always so funky. Oh, what happened? He gave me a, you're being live streamed alert. It looks like it's going. What? Unsupported get request. What does that mean? Facebook. Oh yeah, we're live. Okay, that's so fun. I love this technology thing. Um, <laughs> we'll go ahead and start letting folks in uh, and then we'll get ready with the recording. Welcome in everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, awesome, I think that's everyone that was in the waiting room. We'll keep a lookout for other folks that come along the way. But I suppose we'll go ahead and get started. All right. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming out to our 164th episode of Poets in Pajamas, featuring the wonderful work of Jennifer Martelli and Shlaga Bora. On behalf of Sundress Publications, we are a little reading series brought to you internationally, uh, trying to bring the wonder of poetry to the comfort of your own home. The way that this reading series will work is that we will have two 15-minute readings followed by a 30 minute Q&A. If you have questions for our poets along the way, uh, please bank them and uh, get ready to ask at, during the Q&A section. Um, you can also put them in the chat and you can also use the chat to hype up lines that you loved from the poems or just echo things that you're thinking about uh, during the readings. We are also live on Facebook and for the folks over there, if you have engagement that you want to do with the poets, you can throw it in the chat and we can uh, pass it along, or you can join the Zoom link that will be in the Facebook event. Um, for accessibility purposes, if anyone would like a copy of the poems so that will be read tonight, please email us at poetsinpajamas at gmail.com and we will get those to you. Um, but without further ado, I believe we'll start with the work of Shlaga. Um, Shlaga Bora is a poet from Assam, India. Her work appears or is forthcoming in Longleaf Review, Passenger's Journal, Rogue Agent, 97 Poems, Terribly Tiny Tales and Penguin, and elsewhere. She is pursuing an MFA in poetry at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and is a poetry reader at Grist. A Brooklyn Poets 22 Fellow and recipient of the 23 Spring Fellowship from SAFTA. She is uh, she co-founded Pink Freud, a student-led collective working towards making mental health accessible in India. Instagram at Shlaga A B and Twitter at Shlaga Bora. Shlaga, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, I appreciate you a lot, especially my friends from India. I know it's 4 30 a.m. right there, but I appreciate and love you so much. Um, I love that we're supporting the arts. Um, I am Shlaga. I'm a second year uh, MFA candidate at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Um, I am working on my thesis, which is very exciting, very, very, very scary. Um, but we're writing a lot of poems about the visible and invisible violences on women. Um, especially um, Assamese women um, who do not get a lot of space in archival places around India. So just trying to do something about that gap, writing a little bit about my immigrant experience here, loving America. Um, yeah, um, so we have a lot of different themes today, um, starting with a woman poem, a mother poem, because we're obsessed with those. Um, okay, 
This one's called A Woman is a Lord. That one time when Ma was humming to a Bhupen Hazarika song and accidentally put her hand in the blender right after she turned it on. Her finger flew across the kitchen, blood smeared across the tiles. She smelled like cilantro and chilies. Our neighbors rushed to take her to the ER. Where was my father? And the only thing on her mind, I don't have a bra on. At least put a robe on me. Hilarious. The other time when I was six in our tiny apartment in Bora service filled with smoke from the fried eggs of sitol fish. My mother, an endless whirlpool of breathlessness. My father's hands trembling on the steering wheel, so my neighbors rushed her to the hospital. Her face as puffed as a cloud. I thought that was the last time I would ever hold her hand. When she returned, it was past midnight and I was asleep. I dreamt of her voice. I woke up to her next to me, imagined we were both in heaven. What of this woman who haunts me? What about the one time she lied about being in Kolkata for an office trip when she was in Dika, putting flowers in her hair by a man who would later bring me imported candy? Her picture on his camera roll. Our house, an uproar, a turbulence. What of her is true? What is lower? Okay, um, this next one is called a non-immigrant. Um, so I self-identify as an immigrant on a lot of application forms now that, now that I've completed one year of living in the US. But technically I am a non-immigrant um, because I'm here on a student visa. So that's like the technicality of it all. Sometimes it confuses people. So non-immigrant. I've always been a daughter of place. I have not even been here long enough to qualify as an immigrant. My homies asked me to teach my American friends how to cuss in our tongue. I say profanity is only for myself. My friend from LA says they can turn me into a brown Kylie Jenner. I look at my skin and I don't see brown. My friend insists that I am. I say, can you teach me how to pronounce this? I always pick the wrong syllables to stress on. I laugh before they laugh. I stand for hours in the social security office. I write Assamese in English. My parents think in Assamese and translate every word into English. They're worried they might fail their visa interview. I cannot see Ma's face for three minutes without freezing. We are oceans apart. Data is so expensive and it is only one thing. I pay $30 to draw my palms. My aunt grinds Jetuka every bihu. I think of the Borpita ma fries on Uruka night. I barf the American Mexican burrito bowl. I make my white roommate try pan and her mouth explodes. I cook paratha and buy lassi for lunch. I am running towards and away from my Indianness at the same time. I go to Target and Walmart and Trader Joe's and I practice small talk. I eat everything bagels and cream cheese and croissants and pop tarts and cheese its and a frozen pizza for dinner and I forget I didn't pack my grandmother's bogori pickle. I see cereal on both sides of the aisle. I gave and gave and gave. This next one's called a good immigrant. I'm leading a dual life on my notebook writing day slash month slash year and in forms month slash day slash year, I am becoming a good immigrant. I am not flinching when the phlebotomist digs into my skin in search of blood. When he answers, I love a challenge to my, I have really thin veins. Please be gentle. I have marks of aggression all over my left arm and my mouth is an open sore. So much of our suffering happens in secret. When he grazed my fingers and said, orange is your color, huh? I laughed in true American fashion. I'm treating disease with disease. I'm forgetting how to say my name the way my mother intended me to. 
Forgive our lack of culture. The nurse laughs as she mispronounces my name thrice. I say, well, you tried. It was pretty close. This next one's called America. Um, these might seem like I'm kind of angry, upset at America, but I'm actually really grateful to be here. Um, you know, you gotta criticize the things you love. Anyway, this one's called America. America is the torchbearer of small talk, and yet Maria and I don't speak to each other for a full day. We're not fighting. Our second language exhausts us, so we sit in our living room, me on the couch and her on the rug, napping. In America, I've learned so many things. One, immigrants don't need a common language to love one another. It is our loneliness that binds us. We splash pool water, crawl inside the life-size aquarium to see a turtle. All we see is a wall. We joke about this for weeks, how we fought our way through a crowd to see nothing. Two, everyone here is so lonely, but they're better at hiding it than us. We are home now, soaking the dirty plates in lavender dish soap. We look at each other at the same time and say, remember when? We know exactly which moment we're thinking of. Language wiped out, we burst. Two aliens hoarding boxes of friendship and laughter. I love my friends so much. Um, okay, this next one is a fun one. It's called Bumble Day Chento. Um, so for people who don't know, Chento is a poem where all the lines are borrowed from other poems. Um, in this case, um, all these lines are borrowed from my Bumble dates. So these are all things that my Bumble dates have said to me. And we do not love that a lot. So we wrote a poem about it. Anyway. Bumble Day Chento. Your pictures don't do you justice. I have to give credit where credit's due. You're so smart. It's really great when women love teaching. It's because you're motherly, you know? Are you a fighter in bed? Do you need water? Do you drink whiskey? My family lost everything in the war. Are you hungry? You're from India, so you must know about the Kama Sutra. A boy becomes a man when he starts producing sperm. Let's practice intimacy exercises. Let me buy you food. I love chicken wings. I love you. I should get a TV for sound suppression, if you know what I mean. Let's hold hands. We, all, we make such a cute couple. Do you want to do shots? I want you. I'm sorry my apartment is so empty. Should I lay a towel on the bed? I wanna drink your blood. I'm obsessed with your hair. Do you give head? I need some water. I need to take, I need to take a 20 minute nap. Can't you stay the night? It's past midnight. I think I'm catching feelings, please. This next one's called Dallas Fort Worth. And I wrote this for my friend, Sam, who I love very much. Um, we love mothers and we love friends, all we love. Um, Dallas Fort Worth. Sam waits on the other side of the belt. I stumble through security, gulping 30 ounces of water down. My gut screaming, swimming, apologizing. Sam says, it's 5, 19 a.m. You're allowed to be a hot mess. And we laugh. We're always so hungry for laughter. We're so, so hungry and not even drunk, but we eat Chick-fil-A, also known as homophobic chicken, at Dallas Fort Worth. Picture this, Sam and their lactate pill as I sip on my frosted lemonade. And out of nowhere, Sam says, we should write an essay called Color Theory, and it would be about literally anything other than color theory. I say, maybe it should be about 50 ways my mom fucked me over. Humor is how we keep ourselves alive. And when a friend says, why does Sam walk like a slut, dance like a slut, talk like a slut? Sam says, how do sluts talk, by the way? And then, well, anyone from high school can attest that I am, indeed, theoretically speaking, a slut. 
We laughed, and in the brief pause before our parting, I showed him the many ways I bruised the skin of my therapy journal. We say nothing. I play Girl in Red on my phone, and Sam says, oh, you're that type of queer. And I explain how in some countries, there's only one way to be queer, to be loud, to be anything. But we're in America now, so we can talk about punishment kink and gender clothing and drag queens and, and, and. I want the grandness, they say. How did we get here? Didn't we evolve from chimpanzees? Who even thought of gender? We get on our flights, mine to Knoxville, theirs to New York City. Once home, all alone, I eat stale fries and pray. Blessed be the ones who tarnish their hunger from the bad Chick-fil-A at Dallas-Fort Worth. And I think of frosted lemonade exploding in the roof of my mouth, the queerness, the grandness of it all, and a laugh breaks in my throat. This is my last poem. It's kind of a sad one. It's also about a friend um, who I lost a few years ago, but who I think about every day and who I love very much. The Void. I sing along to, I can buy myself flowers, but when you hug me outside the bar and pull out a yellow tulip from the pocket of your checkered coat, here, I plug this for you. I know how sad you've been this week. I imagine we have always been tied by loneliness. And in 2014, when we were in the Mama Margaret Auditorium, where everyone warned me that you were trying to flirt with every girl, but one look inside your mind, and I knew you were gasping for air, joy, a safe place to hide your delicate suffocating secret you still hadn't learned how to describe. Last night, I celebrated your birthday with a double shot of Malibu and pineapple juice at midnight. And I thought how when we were standing outside the bar, I was zoning out as usual. And my Brazilian friend Maria asked, what are you looking at? And when I said nothing, just staring into the void. And when she asked, is the void a gay bar? We laughed, but I want you to know that I thought of you and your laughter rang in my ears. And Thank you so much, everyone, for being here once again. Really appreciate your presence here. Thank you for listening to my little poems. Laga, thank you so much for that wonderful reading. Folks, I know you've got questions about those poems and for Schlaga, so please write them down and prepare them for our Q&A coming up uh, in just a little bit. Right now, we have another reading to get to, uh, one from the wonderful Jennifer Martelli. Jennifer Martelli is the author of The Queen of Queens and My Tarantula, awarded an honorable mention from the Italian, Italian American Studies Association, selected as a must read by the Massachusetts Center for the Book and named as a finalist for the Housatonic Center, uh, excuse me, uh, named as a finalist for the Housatonic Book Award. She is also the author of the chat books In the Year of Ferraro, and Nix's Mate Press, uh, and Afterbird, winner of the Gray Book Press Open Reading. Her work has appeared in the Academy of American Poets Poem of the Day, uh, Poetry, the Tahoma Literary Review, the Sycamore Review, Cream City Review, Verse Daily, Iron Horse Review, winner of the Photo Finish Contest, and elsewhere. Jennifer Martelli has twice received grants from the Massachusetts Cultural Council for her poetry. She is co-poetry editor for Mom Egg Review. Jennifer, whenever you're ready. Oh, thank you so much, Aslan and SJ. Um, it's such an honor to be reading for Poets in Pajamas. I, it, you guys were sort of the first to do these Zoom readings, even when they weren't Zoom readings uh, before COVID. Um, so it's it's not an easy thing to do, and you've done it so well. I'm really honored. Schlager, it's wonderful to, um, to have met you and to have heard your amazing poems. So... Thank you. Um, I'm going to start with two poems from my book, uh, My Tarantella, that was named um, uh, one of the best dressed in uh, the sundress uh, contest awards that they give. Uh, sundress is such uh, a support for poetry and for writing. So I'm, I'll start with two poems from that book. Uh, in the North End, Boston loomed lit a wasp's nest ignited and inhaled. My friend's lungs stopped for five feet panic seconds. Two millennia ago, Sappho said, 
in some future time, someone will think of you. I said, count. In 1919, the brick streets in the North End flooded with a million gallons of thick black strap molasses. My friend's big red heart beat four valves vibrating, a mandolin tremolo. Count, I said, the asters, the Pleiades. Equinox. Time clutched its toad green watering can and doused the soil, grew things to kill. Time hummed that old diamondback song, hummed the song of cigarettes. Time watered and dawn seeped up from the ground well before the hot sun rose hungry, ready to singe the tender shoots. Time poured more drinks and a hunting knife grew, reflected light, then a lung, then a heart, seven layers of skin. Time gave water to a small patch and Sappho rose. Then the Pleiades, soft and white as asters, which were not yet planted. Then Sappho's lover under the arbor entwined in lattice. Time will kill her too. Time brushed its hands on daisy embroidered overalls. Time thought I should plant round things, vinyl albums, snakes eating their tails, belly buttons, cancer cells, dilation, eye and cervical, street lamp globes, penumbras, small circles of friends. Time drew on the yellow papyrus just poking through. I should grow a dark haired girl who is afraid of all of this. I should grow her wounds and purple scars. So these next two poems are from um, the Queen of Queens. I realized too, I just wanna say one thing, there were a couple of other poems about cigarettes and I should tell you now, I am a recovering smoker, so I guess I still think of them. <clears throat> Yesterday, I was so angry, I broke things with my mind. The chunky juice glass on the granite counter, the cat's chip saucers for kibble and cream, the thick white mug, its shattered curves lay in fat white pieces, thick as oyster shells, the brokenness capturing light like a poem about the moon or the moon's memory of the tide. I've been angry for so long, or maybe just afraid of not really being here. Parts of me in pieces, left eye, my upper lip, the third rib, the mound at the base of my thumb. One of those seasonal constellations connected with a finger. Cleaning it up was hardest. Its skinny pieces reflected blue and cold, hungry like a mirror. They wanted the tender instep, the calloused soul. They wanted the deep green purple vein. I swept and swept with my favorite whisk broom, but still the tiny slivers shone all over my floor, a night sky magnetic and inversed. Um, the only thing you need to know with this next poem, um, I'd read this article in the New York Times that the words anger, hangnail and angina all have the same root. Um, it's like this ancient German root that has something to do with constriction, which I found fascinating. <laughs> I think that's really the, you know, hangnail. I, I, I don't think I even knew that was one word until uh, I read that article. So root. I bought a new knife, sliced an onion through its skin, through its 16 layers. I was Sylvian and Plathian. I sliced close to the nail bed of my left ring finger, low to the lanula. This is the winter of hangnails and split nails. I spit nails, crescent moons fly out of my mouth and across the maple wood floor and little white knives of cartilage sprout still hinge to my skin, catch on my gray wool wrap. The root of anger is the kissing cousin of hangnail. Today, I learned that pearls without cores make the ideal sculpting medium if you were to sculpt skulls. The skins don't crack or peel. 
I can never wed again. The kissing cousin of anger is angina, a stab wound to my sacred heart, the one wound with wire. My grandma said if we swallowed seeds from a fruit, we'd grow that tree in our stomachs. If we swallowed the fingernails we chewed off, our tummies would be torn open by the claws we grew. This next poem has an epigraph uh, from Sylvia Plath's Eavesdropper on which I white cigarette burn. 2 a.m. feeding. I was a menthol cigarette, new milk decoupage down my back blades, down my breastbone. My mind a burning tip lit red on the electric stove's uterine coils. The long labor, smoke curling, calcifying and cold, mica, cocaine, talcum, blue. February stars stared through the kitchen window through 15 French panes of glass. These were the constellations on St. Bridget's night, big dog, twins, rabbit, newborn, the unblinking newborn eyes. The night a telescope tamped down between my palms. I was a cigarette left dangling on the porch rail. Below me, the frosty chalk glyph of the feral cat glows on the pitch black tar pitch. And we will fast forward 25 years after the didgeridoo concert. The breeze blew over the Charles and all that was left of me was the wicker work, wicker work form of a post-menopausal woman. Later, I asked about the moon cup embroidered in a hoop at the feminist fiber fair in Alston. It looked like a chemist vial used to catch maroon drops fallen from the circling lunar phases. It's funny how an older mind tries to make sense of blood. I told the cruel worker, I've no need for cups anymore. The gibbous humps waxing must have required spools and spools of thread. At the BU diner, someone soldered skulls into the wood tables, one cranium tucked into the edge kitty corner to the fork. Men from the concert filed in. Most were young, all had beards. One man braided his beard, one strung blue beads, but the best was the bald man with the short white beard and big smile like a crescent moon. I tried to read old newspaper clippings from the Phoenix glued to the wall. My hot red mug of soup shone and steamed and I blew and blew by the spoonful. Um, and my last two poems are new. Uh, this poem uh, contains at the end, I'll do the um, international sign for quoted material, um, a line from uh, Sylvia Plath. The chain. Tucked in the toe of an odd sock, my lost silver chain lies curled and knotted too tight to fit around my neck, even as a choker, some links broken like an old snake's cervical bones. Once I wore it strung with a silver charm, a horn that fell to my throat's hollow, kept away the curse of eyes and of envy. Today is the coldest day so far this year. I've hung straw crosses from the back door post for St. Bridget, patron saint of abortions and things thawing. Deep dirt pockets of animals and roots, snakes and last year's roses, sleeping voles. I can unknot the, this chain with two sharp common pins, pick the tiny locked spine, loosen all the archaic root words of shan. Links of precious metal or of iron, to twist, to twine, to hunt, to snare. Jealousy can open the blood. It can make black roses. I can wound badly and I have. Today I enter my daughter's birth month and my own. You are metal, my chart says. You attract and you orbit. Beware toxic loops. And again, thank you to Poets in Pajamas. Um, this last poem uh, is a line from uh, the painter Eva Yuskovich. Is there anything under that layer? 
I fear suffocation and I fear snakes. And once in a movie, I saw a man with a python wrapped around his whole head. He couldn't even scream. That actor, a pale, flaccid man, wry and always amused, died not long ago. One summer, the previews and teasers ran in a loop for the mummy redo. A young princess betrayed by her father was mummified alive, wrapped in cloth and locked in an iron tomb carved with the face of a screaming woman and snakes. A snake can crawl brand new out of its own skin. The father betrayed his daughter because he adhered to his own mythology like most fathers. I think I fear suffocation because of the weight covering me, stars asphyxiating themselves, colors imploding into jewel tone hues like the diamonds of a hungry snake. One friend insisted I fear snakes because I fear the penis. Another said I fear trains crossing bridges because they look like snakes if I could see them while flying way up where the air is too thin to breathe. I fear suffocation and snakes and bridges and the penis, but mostly I don't want to be disregarded. That's the fear. I'm wrapped in snakeskin and cloth and cold thick iron. It's heavy and I'm left, I'm just left. Thank you. Oh my goodness, Jennifer, thank you so much. And what a wonderful poem to end on. What a, it's a strong image. Uh, I also must say that I, if I recall correctly, said <laughs> the tarantula instead of the tarantella, which kind of just, they're just little different things, uh, but I, They actually are, that's what, that's what tarantella means, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you both for reading so much. Um, we will transition now into our Q&A. If folks want to turn their cameras on and ask, feel free. You can also throw it in the chat if you would like uh, for me to ask for you. Um, I'll get us kick-started with a question for both poets. Uh, maybe Schlaga, if you would like to answer first if it comes. Um, but we always love to ask uh, if there is anything that you have read recently that just wowed you or something in um, your craft experience that you've been obsessed with recently. Um, but just anything you would like to signal boost or gush about if, if it's on your mind. Um, I'm taking um, a poetry workshop specifically ded dedicated to prose poems and hybrid forms right now uh, with the amazing Ileana Rocha who's here. Thank you for coming. Um, but that class and just in general, I think I've, I've been thinking a lot about hybridity in my work or just work in general and how sort of um, by not pressurizing myself about um, form or particular themes, um, how can I like set myself more free or am I like reaching towards bigger overarching themes in my work that possibly I am, I'm not able to see because I'm so myopic to my work. Um, so that's been amazing. Um, yesterday I read, um, Step Out by Edgar Kunz. It was amazing. Um, such a great book. No misses in that book. Uh, I'm also reading Driving Without a License by Janine Joseph, uh, which is also an amazing book. And I just feel very lucky and grateful to be writing and reading at the same time as these people. Yeah. Um, lately, I've been obsessed with the. Oops. Sorry, I don't know what just happened here. <laughs> My phone just went off, sorry. Um, lately, I've been obsessed with epistolary poems, letter poems. Um, last year, I read Rachel Menny's book, The Naomi Letters uh, from Boa, which blew me away. I mean, it, it just opened up all these possibilities in writing and in using the second person, which I never trusted, you know, um, in poems and my own uh, and others. So uh, I read this wonderful article um, in Lit Hub and I'm blanking on who wrote it now. I'm so sorry, I'll, I'll think of this like two tonight, but you know, just about the, um, the strange place that an epistolary poem lives in, you know, where it's, you know, this intercepted thing. And I, I just found that amazing. Paisley Rechdell has a really good essay on it too. So a lot of my poems in the past year 
have been um, epistolary poems. And to Schlage's point, you know, just the whole idea, it, it allows, it freed me from the line somewhat. Um, you know, it just, it, it allowed me to do things in poetry that I wasn't able to do. So I would really write, I mean, if you're feeling like I want to try something else, I would try that book. Um, I did the Sealy Challenge. Um, and, uh, Monica Young's book uh, from, from was just, you know, I was another one that that blew me away and, and what she does with uh, form or non-form. I, you know, I don't know how you want to define that, but yeah. Thank you both so much. Um, floor is now open if you would like to ask something. Um, in the meantime, I have another question uh, for both of you being um, readers of poetry, both personally and then also in a work sense, uh, be it for a press as a reader or as an editor. And I was curious if through the process of editing or being a reader um, for a journal, if that has, as to your words, Jennifer, opened anything up to you, as you have to critically take in work um, of higher volume and appraise it, if it has made you notice anything about your own work, um, or has, has it kind of changed the way that you approach your writing process? Um. Yeah, that's a really, really good question because, you know, you have two different hats on, you know, when, when you're, you know, editing or, you know, uh, reading submissions. Um, I mean, the, the first thing I have to say, there's so much good poetry out there. You know, there's so much good poetry out there and so many people writing it and, you know, way more than, you know, say the mom egg would accept. So, I mean, I think that's true for, for a lot of journals too. Um, I guess, uh, you know, it, it's made me a better submitter to journals. Let me say that in terms of, oh, okay, I like this. I like how this person kind of like introduced themselves. You know, it's kind of nice how they did that. Maybe I'll copy that a little bit. <laughs> um, but in terms of my writing, um, oh, you know, it, it's funny because I, I really do compartmentalize it. But maybe I think in terms of, uh, you know, what words do I use a lot? And I don't mean like uh, obsessions, because I, I love obsessions. I, I don't have a problem with that. But, you know, just little words, you know, how often do I use articles when I don't need to? Um, you know, I, how am I ending if I am, you know, lineating a poem? How, how careful am I? You know, does it seem intentional? You know, so things like that more, um, I'm going to say more technical you know, parts of it, so, yeah. I think uh, my answer is pretty similar, um, but one big thing that I've learned is just to be kinder to myself and to the work. Um, Cause sometimes in the queue, I'd be seeing someone's name who I admire very, very much. And I would be like fangirling over their work. And then in the end, when we have to send them like a personalized injection or sometimes even a form injection, I'm like, Oh, I only see the work that you put out in the world, but sometimes we write not so amazing poems and that's okay, you know, like um, just being able to separate the sense of self-worth from the work, I think has been really helpful for me. And it's like, it's nothing personal. No one's thinking about you and hating you just because they rejected you. <laughs> that's a great point. That's excellent. Yeah, that's true. I think too, I mean, I to your point, I I've I've um developed a much thicker skin, you know, uh just in, in saying, you know, this really isn't personal, you know, it's it's about the poem. And you know, certainly we've rejected, you know, I hate using that word, we have not taken the poem submitted to us <laughs> from people. I know and love, you know, and admire and vice versa, you know, so, yeah. I have a question about um, 
it's talking more about obsessions in general, but um, you mentioned it, Jen, and, and I was thinking about that with your poems, but um, maybe this is a both of you question because I'm, you know, I, I heard that some reoccurring words in some of your poems, like asters and Pleiades, and a, like the specificity of asters, I want to know like what's behind this aster, like specifically that's like calling to you, but also from a craft perspective, when you find like these, these repetitions in your work, how do you, what do you use to guide you of like, oh, like word search too many times I said this, let me change it. And then when you say, oh no, like this is important, I'm going to keep you know, pulling these words back in, they matter. So like, how do you let that guide you? And that's for both poets. Thanks. Do you want to go, Schlaga? <laughs> so um, that book, My Tarantella and uh, The Queen of Queens, they were both I, uh, project books, uh, meaning, um, you know, they were about specific events that happened you know so they 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 existed in time you know they existed at a specific time so um with uh with my tarantella the event that i was talking about was this murder of a woman um of this queer woman in queens new york in the 60s and it happened in march it happened like at the cusp of spring and that was really important so that i i checked it out um that's the the Pleiades like are in the sky at that time. Um, asters come a little later. It's the last flower that blooms in the fall, the asters. And I like the sound of it, asteroid and star and, and all that. So it just sort of worked. Um, so that I, I played those, those two images are two that went through that whole book, you know. Um, as I said, cigarettes and snakes come up a lot. I think I, that's just an obsession I live with. So um, I really should look at that a little bit. Uh, but in each book, there, there are these images of snakes. It's just, it's just such like a, a scary thing to me. And, and um, it's an ever-present image. I, I think it probably has a lot different symbolism um, to a lot of different people. But And I have to look at that, too. So. So I don't, you know, I mean, as long, I mean, I, I think this is true for any image or anything in a poem, as long as it feels intentional to the poem, you know, if it's like just throwing in a symbol, you know, just because it has to be there. I think, I think I know it and I think the reader knows it too. That's such an amazing answer. I actually don't have anything smart to say. <laughs> Um, but I think I'm just trying to let go of the need to like have control over my work. Um, a lot of mentors have told me that my work is smarter than I am often, um, and my work knows what it needs. Um, so rather than trying to dissect it and being like, oh, I have to change every single line because I hate it. Um, I'm sort of trying to let go and see what happens, especially thinking about a collection or a thesis. I feel like it just makes a lot of sense for repeat, repeated images or just, um, I feel like water bodies come up a lot in my work, uh, which makes sense because I'm a triple water sign. Um, and I also, water bodies are so grounding to me. Um, so I think it makes sense that these images or just these points in general, the overarching themes are in conversation with each other. Um, and that seems very intentional uh, from the poems part, sometimes even if I don't know it yet. And then I'll, after five years, I'll be in therapy talking about something and I'm like, wait, but I wrote a poem about that. Um, but how did I not realize it? So it's like, it's all. We have any other questions? Well, I'm going again. I thought up a big one. Uh, Schlage, with you talking about your thesis, um, it reminded me of, um, I'm currently taking a class um, on sequencing, uh, the sequence of collections with Melissa Crow at, um, UNCW. Um, and um, Melissa's just a wizard, first of all, but 
the the investigation into the sequence of a collection and how you piece everything together is I feel like so much more um, difficult to quantify than you would first think. Cause it, you know, like when you start writing poetry I feel like a lot of us just kind of like, eh, do, do, do. we just kind of piece it together and then you're really trying to get intentional with it. And you're trying to think how does all this link together? And so with Schlaga, you beginning um, this thesis process and with Jennifer having gone through it with, I think you said two full collections. Um, and of course, chat books. I wondered if um, either of you had um, any thoughts on that process, um, being that one of you is a little newer to it and one of you has gone through it quite a few times. Honestly, I am so intimidated <laughs> by the organizing organizational process. And I think it's really easy to get lost in that thought and not actually write the poems and be like, oh, but what sections am I gonna have, you know? Um, I'm trying not to think about that right now. Um, that is a spring semester problem. <laughs> um, but I think generally the advice that I've gotten because I was working on a chapbook collection right before this. And the general advice was like, um, it should be like a wave where there are highs and there are lows. And sometimes you sit by the beach and you read and you don't wanna go in the water. And sometimes you just wanna be in the water for three hours straight, you know? Um, so if it's like super intense poems for seven pages, maybe you'd be like, oh, I need a ruler. So maybe just throw in some joyful, happy poems in the middle. And this is all me being just like idealistic, you know, in how I would like to be. And also joyful poems for me might be very different from another reader. So I can't really objectively predict that. But I think that's a really interesting way to think about it. Um, I also like to think about it as like a house and how the rooms are arranged in a house um, and how all of us have slightly different architectures and yet that's what feels most comfortable to us. Um, so yeah, just like thinking about a house, the book as a house, um, I think is an interesting idea to explore. But I'm so curious to hear from Jennifer because I'm like, two full-end collections, that's amazing. Oh, this, I, I, I was almost having, like I was getting anxiety just thinking about this question. So anxiety provoking it is for me. Um, I'll be honest with you. I, this, this isn't even something that I, I could say comes intuitively to me. Um, this is the hardest part, even with, you know, as I said, the two books, you know, were very, um, project oriented and um you know my friend sabaga is here and she just published a wonderful um an amazing collection on lois just oh yay but um you know <laughs> speaking of which woohoo <laughs> but i you know you'd think that it would be so easy you know they, they're all kind of they all have to do with one another um i really can get so lost in the weeds and almost paralyzed with really overthinking this. So I, about two years ago, I went to this, um, we were still doing Zoom, everything was Zoom still then. Um, uh, Susan Rich and Kelly Agadon uh, had this, uh, you know, organizing a workshop manuscript and uh, Diane Seuss, you know, goddess Diane Seuss and, um, and uh, January Gill O'Neill, my good friend, were there and they they were talking about organizing manuscript. And for the first time, I felt like I actually had some tools, like real tools. Like, you know, people say like, let the poems talk to one another. I'm like, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> uh, and this, this is for me. Now, some other people would disagree, but this I found, you know, it, one of those life-changing moments, but um, think of the poem, the book, I'm sorry, in threes. Now it might not actually might not have three actual sections, but think of it that way. And they each have a theme, you know. Um, start the po start the book with a pretty kind of straightforward um, poem that sort of is the key. This is what we're going to be talking about in the book, um, and and buy a really pretty like spring binder i love this is my favorite thing to put your book in and that binder is only for your book and you can decorate it and you have your notes 
So doing those three things for the first time, and I mean, I went to, I got an MFA, I went to grad school, you know, all that stuff. I felt that I actually had, you know, tools in my belt to sort of put, you know, these, this jumble of poems that, you know, I just, I really had no way. I mean, I, I, nothing felt, nothing felt intentional. I used that word earlier, but nothing really felt like I meant it, you know, when I put poems in all this. No, I, I love that. Um, I think it was, um, Gregory Orr, who says that you can have like story and structure or music and imagination and you get like one from each column. And I, I, I think I get where he's coming from. But also, I love that idea, too, as kind of a remedy to that. And it's like, no, you can just apply it in different ways. You need the structure. You can also have a literal physical notebook to get the imagination going. Like like there you don't have to it doesn't have to be so stark. And, and analytical as you try to like thread together, it, you know, like it, it's fun. Like hopefully, even though this is also work, it can also be fun. Um, yeah, those are lovely answers. Thank you both so much. Uh, we have time for one more question. If someone has had one simmering on the back burner that they would like to pull out. I think that might be it then. Um, Schlaga, Jennifer, thank you so, so much for doing this reading and for sharing your testimonies and your craft. Um, we appreciate it so much. Um, this will be on Facebook uh, in perpetuity for your rewatching purposes. We have also begun uploading all of our readings on our YouTube. Uh, if you would like to send that to folks uh, that were not able to attend, or if you ever want to return to this wonderful reading. It will be there uh, indefinitely. Uh, also, please keep a lookout for our next reading, which will be October 15th, I believe, featuring Ide Thompson and Annette Kovigaru. And for everything else, you can follow us uh, on WordPress, Poets in Pajamas, and also on our Facebook, um, Poets in Pajamas via Sundress Publications. Schlaga, Jennifer, thank you so much. And everyone, please have a great night. Thank you. Bye-bye.